Welcome to the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers. There are no traffic jams along the extra mile when you're studying for your bar exam. And now your hosts, Jackson Mummy and Megan Saya from Celebration Bar Review. Hey everybody, welcome. It is Wednesday, January 12th. We are on our new platform and uh, and Megan is here with me. Hi Megan, how are you? Hi. We COVID has hit our house, unfortunately, um, but we're hanging in there and I think everyone's on the upswing and yeah, just but hoping we, we get a better uh, finish to the first month of 2022 than the start to it. That's for sure. It has been a crazy start already for sure. And we are going to be talking about some bar exam news around COVID and some other things. We're going to be answering some student questions that we've gotten and uh, we are then going to t- uh, resume our series from way back when, right? Before uh, the holidays of the hardest bar exam problems, the things that keep you up at night. And today we're going to be looking at double jeopardy. So very exciting to, to be able to do that. Megan, I, I think probably you and I should uh, pivot here a little bit and, and talk about the, uh, the state of the world in bar review right now. Yeah, so definitely, as we talked about last week, that there were a lot of questions about, is my exam still going to be online? Or is my exam still going to be in person? Am I going to be able to take it online? We have a little bit of movement in that area. A couple things. First is that the first thing that happened was Nevada changed their um way that they're giving the exam. So they are the only state thus far to have done this, um, but they're going to do a remote exam. Now, because as we talked about, the NCBE has not, is not allowing their materials to be given online. That means that they will not be giving the MBE at this exam. So that's the only way that a state can do an online test is to not use any materials from the national conference. So for Nevada, that means no MBE. On this exam. Now, what happened after that is an interesting announcement from the NCBE. They came out on um, Monday and they said that basically people were concerned about what happens if the state bar doesn't have a choice, but the state tells them we have these COVID restrictions and you can't have, let's say, a thousand people in a ballroom for three days for two days, um, taking this test in close quarters. What the NCBE said is that they still will not be doing an online exam, but they said if their public health restrictions are the reason why a bar cannot be given, then the NCBE will give testing materials to that jurisdiction for a makeup test in late March. And so that means that it would still be an in-person exam. It just would get pushed back. So as we're talking and we're seeing with Omicron, it's looking like this potentially is something that is going to peak and then at some point, (laughs) hopefully level off. The NCB is hoping that by late March, they could give that these public health restrictions would be eased and they would be able to give the normal in-person bar in those jurisdictions with new materials. So I want to reiterate, this has not happened anywhere yet. This is there's no state yet where that is the case. But it is now, for the first time, an option with the NCBE. Jackson, I kind of wonder if Nevada just saying, fine, we don't need the NCBE, we're going to do our own thing, made them nervous enough to say, oh, maybe we should give people some kind of a plan B, rather than what their position has been, no plan B. It is literally, if you use our materials, which is almost everyone, then you're doing it in person at the end of February. Yeah, I, it feels that way to me. I think Nevada called their bluff. They went to the poker table and said, and we don't need you. And the NCB said, check. <laughs> We're not sure what to do here. I could see a possibility in California or New York, which are socially, I think, more aggressive about COVID restrictions. Both of those states might theoretically say, we're going to take advantage of this plan B, or they could, California could do what Nevada did and say, we're just not gonna do the the multi-state. 
Nonetheless, having said that, having raised that possibility, you cannot study as though either of any of those things will happen. You need to study as though the exam will be given on the last Tuesday and Wednesday in February of 2022, and it will be given in person and you will be wearing a mask in most of these locations. I spoke to a student today who said that they were studying yesterday with a mask on all day and how challenging that is to actually keep a mask on for six hours nonstop. So I think that you have to prepare for the exam. We know from our experiences in 2020 and 2021, things can change. If they do, we're going to let you know and we'll adjust as necessary. But for right now, you just go forward. I think that if you're in a state like Florida or Georgia, where politically they have a tendency to just deny that COVID even exists, there is little to no possibility that they would change their exams. That just seems politically unlikely to me. But I could see states like Massachusetts or California or New York saying, you know what, we're just not comfortable giving this exam. But I also think a lot of these bar examiners are just watching and waiting like the rest of us, waiting to see if this wave crop, if it's going to crest and we, we get back down to something that looks more normal by the start of February. So too early to tell in any of these settings. I think the best advice we can give all of you is study as though you're going to have the exam. And if it turns out that it gets postponed, we've been through that fire drill, haven't we? Yeah, we definitely have. I think what's very interesting about this time through as opposed to before is that this has taken all of the not all, but most of the decision-making power away from the state bar and really put it more on the state legislature or the governor or whoever it is in your particular state who's making these decisions about COVID protocols. So I do find that interesting that the state bar may say, we wanna give the test, we're ready to give the test, but obviously if state law is saying you can't do it under these conditions, then they, they can't do it until late March. Very interesting. I also do want to point out that there, hopefully people are checking with their jurisdictions, but in places like Florida, masks are not required last I saw for the exam. So um, do always be checking with your, we always say this, but yeah. always be checking with your particular jurisdiction to figure out all the rules about what is allowed, what is not allowed. If you do um, have the option or have to wear a mask, are you allowed to bring your own or are they providing them, et cetera? So just be aware. I would put on your daily checklist of assignments, <laughs> go to your state bar's website every day and just check it out and refresh your browser and check it out. They are notoriously bad at communicating these kinds of decisions and there will be a fair amount of rumor out there. I've already seen some articles and some blog posts that got it wrong. So just be careful, go to the source. We'll do our best, but obviously with 50 states, we're not scouring them the way you would scour your own state. And so it, the responsibility will lie with you, not with the bar examiners, not with any third party to, to keep you notified. It's an unsettled time. Again, it seems like we're still unsettled after two years plus of this. I think the one thing that we do know is that online exams must have been a bigger disaster than we realized because literally no one is saying we could go to an online exam. Amanda asked in the chat box, were there any statements from the NCBE early on why they decided not to offer an online exam? I think this is interesting because it's the talking out of the both sides of their mouth thing, which I can understand, but is obviously frustrating that on one hand they were saying, the online exams were a success, that it was totally a reliable way to admit people to the, the bar. But then on the other hand, there we never want to do that again. And it's not the best, it's not really the way that we want to admit people to the bar. So obviously been a lot of internal discussion, I'm sure, about the um, frustrations and difficulties with doing the online exam. And the NCBE just said very early into after we finished the last bar exam. And yeah. that was it. They would not be doing another one online. And but, but it went great and we loved it and everybody loved it. <laughs> Perfect. But we're never going to do it again. <laughs> so until 2026 when, you know, who knows? Yeah. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance here, but for now, assume that you're taking the exam in person and that you'll be uh, doing it at the appointed times and we'll see what happens from now. It could change. Trust me. 
the, the bar examiners are actually quite good at announcing things late Wednesday afternoon after we finish this. Uh, there we go. All right, great. So we'll keep you guys updated. All right, let's move on to some student questions. I've got some study strategy questions, and the first one is definitely one that we're hearing a lot from students now that we've entered into the new year, and it is, what are the benchmarks that I should be hitting right now? Where should I be? Um, where should I be in my study guide? Where should I be in with my MBE question practice scores? What should my practice and my study look like right now? Okay, that's great. Let's break that in first to the, the where should you be in the completion of the course. We are now at, uh, what, about a little over 40 days, I think, to the exam. I think that's right. And so we finished what I call the dreaded seventh week. And what that means is that most of you, if you've been studying for a while, you are getting closer now to the completion of the substantive part of the study. And what that will record on your uh, platform is somewhere in the 40th percentile, 40 to 50th percentile. That's about where half of the course assignments fall into that grouping. Now, if you just started your studies, you're not in the 40th percentile, so don't freak out. You're just going at a different pace. But if you are, bless you, Megan, (laughs) if you are working at about a 20 to 25 hour a week pace, which is where I think most of you are, you should probably be somewhere in the 40th percentile right now, unless you just began your studies. So that's the first benchmark. If you're beyond the 49th percentile, if you're in the 50th percentile, you are now starting to encroach on the uh, review side of the course. It's not definitively at 50%, but it's it's a good rough marker. And uh, that would be fine. This would be a good place uh, to be there. But many of you will not hit that stage until the first 10 days of February. So don't freak out if you're not up to that level yet. So that's the first benchmark that I would see for most of you right now. The second benchmark when it comes to performance, particularly on multiple choice questions, is that if you are not just starting the course, so you're a little deeper into the course, you've been through a few subjects, I would like to see you getting uh, 30% of your multiple choice question uh, correct at this stage. Anything better than that, I'm happy with. If you're getting 40% or 50%, great. If you're getting 60 or 70%, that's awesome. But 30% is, it tells me that you're, you understand the assignment. You're doing the work you need to do, and you're beginning to learn. We pointed this out last week that we're now at the stage where we're interested in process more than outcome as teachers because we want you doing the right process. But we know that you as students are more interested in the outcome because it feels like when the clock switched over to 2022 and you're a February bar taker, the exam was imminent, right? Is that a good way to put it, Megan? Yeah, definitely. I and think it's like human nature. We had all the holidays. And so a lot of people, maybe their study process and timing looked really different over the last month and the exam felt really far away because it was in another year. And then, yeah, we switched uh, into January and definitely we see it every year. That This is what happens that people get a little bit more panicky about, oh my gosh, am I behind? Yeah, it feels like the exam is right here, but your skill set isn't right here. And so there's this disconnect and the disconnect causes all kinds of difficulties and emotional difficulties and study difficulties and relational difficulties. June was saying that in her coaching call, she had some students that said, yeah, I'm really not doing well in multiple choice. I'm getting 50 or 60% correct. And like, whoa, you're doing great. But to the student, it felt bad because they're thinking, I need to be passing right now. You don't. And Megan, I know you and I hear this all the time when we're doing essay writing conferences. Students say, is this passing work? It's not really the right question to ask yet, is it? Yeah, not yet. It's great if it is. That's fantastic. But the the train's not leaving the station yet. So you don't have to be all packed and ready to go. So I hope that helps with benchmarks. The next question, I will generalize it a bit more. They're talking about specifically, does the greater care if you double space or single space your writing? I think in general, I will extrapolate from that. Does this, How much does style matter in the grading? Jackson, what do you think? If you're handwriting... I think in some states, you're actually forbidden from going every other line. So hopefully no one's handwriting. Uh, If you're typing, really, I think it's set for you automatically on the the 
ExamSoft software. So I don't think that matters. The kind of formatting that you need is the FLA format. You want to stay in Roman numerals for your main headings and capital A and capital B and C for your subheadings and then paragraphing. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the key is I don't care and the grader does not care about things. Do you put two spaces after a sentence or do you put one or things like that? What you need is it needs to be readable. So that's why we say use the heading you and space out uh, between the headings, right? Make it readable for your reader and use paragraphs and things like that because those kind of breaks are what make the reader able to follow what you're saying. So it's just don't overthink it. I don't care about the things that are more individualistic, but I do care about the basic like if your kid, you know, or your niece or nephew was turning in an essay in, you know, like middle school, would their teacher be like, I can't even read this. So that's, those are the standards like headings, capitalization, punctuation, basic grammar and spelling doesn't have to be perfect, but we want to really make it readable. Those are the, the benchmarks that you want to hit. Yeah, I think it's when any of those things interfere with understanding and comprehension on the part of the reader, then they're problems. Up until then, most anything can be worked with. I'm doing a study on Enneagrams, for those of you that are familiar. That question obviously came from an Enneagram one. Someone has it's had to be perfect. Don't worry about it. You don't need to be perfect to pass the bar exam. You just have to be good enough. And so don't get too hung up on that stuff. Yeah. All right, next question is about multiple choice. This student is feeling like really frustrated because their scores are going down. So they're studying and then they're taking, and I'm not sure if they're doing scores going down in the same subject or move on to the next subject and do worse on the, the first batch of multiple choice questions. But what should people be doing if that's their situation? Yeah, I think that it starts again with mindset. You're not taking an exam right now you're practicing. And so we're interested in the, the learning process. And so missing questions is a great opportunity to learn and then to take that learning and apply it to your notes, whether it's a mind map or uh, your regular note taking and say, why did I miss this? What is What am I not doing? Or to work on your selective intuition, the methodology and the approach of how to answer questions generally. I think it is natural to see a drop off right after the the holidays for lots of reasons that you've already talked about that just getting back into the study process getting into the swing of it i think the uncertainty that we're facing right now on a large level national level worldwide level has some impact and people lose their focus and so it's not unusual but even when things are just typically normal we see around from day 50 to day 40 is a really bad period of time for people. It just feels ugly and everything gets enlarged. And so instead of 60% correct, you're getting 52% correct. And that seems like a tremendous change at that moment when in fact, it's, it's almost uh, insignificant. So I, I would say, I'm not trying to discount the frustration that the student feels, but I would say it will probably go away. Just keep pursuing and doing what we've been teaching you to do. What we typically see is that there is that dip somewhere in this 50 to 40 day period. And then we start to see scores begin to move towards where they need to be. Yeah. Keep in mind that the mindset, and I know June has like the best mindset coaching, but my little two cents is keeping in mind that the concept of, I, I don't understand it yet. That yet is so important because it is very, and this student shared, they feel really defeated. And I think it's very defeating to feel like, I don't know this. And so the change in thinking, I don't know it yet, but me doing it wrong and then going in and learning this concept means that I give, I'm giving myself a great opportunity to learn it so that the next time I see something like this, I will know how to tackle it, okay? I don't know what it is. We, um, we're all so hard on ourselves. I think if you were learning any other new skills, gosh, like if you're learning how to snowboard, you don't go down that first hill and think, oh my gosh, I, I just spent half the time sitting on my behind because I kept falling over and over again. Like I just, I'm never going to get this right. You need to, if you think that way, you won't do it. But if you say, okay, 
what did I learn? What did I figure out about how I can do this? Um, what do I know? And then you get up and you try it again and again, and eventually it clicks. So unless you're like me and then it never clicks for snowboarding, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, but I watched your kids uh, surfboard and it's pretty amazing. <laughs> Surf out there yeah. and flip off the board. I'm like, oh, right. that hurt. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay. yeah. There's a lot of falling uh, yeah. before you can manage to stand. So, yeah. same with the MBE. Yeah. All right. Next is a photo reading question. Uh, someone who is nervous about the photo reading program because they just feel like they're doing everything wrong. And I know this is a question we get all the time. And I know you've got a uh, your answer for it. So Jackson, take it away. <laughs> yeah, you can't do it wrong. This is from a student who's just starting photo reading and they are discovering that photo reading is totally unsatisfying to the conscious brain completely. You photo read, you finish and you go, well, those guys, they cheated me, man. I spent all that money and time and there's nothing here. I got nothing. But yeah, your conscious brain has got nothing. It's like filling up. It's like charging the electric motor in your car and not, and you say, there's no gas in my tank. Yeah, because you didn't put gas in the tank. It's not for that. Uh, photo reading goes to the non-conscious mind and you can't do it wrong. It is a physiological response to the reading process. And really what photo reading is about is how you activate that material. It's not the actual process of photo reading. So the process of doing mind maps, of taking notes, of activating through lectures and question practice is where the real meaning comes. And it turns out this particular student has not completed the entire photo reading course yet. And so I understand that frustration. But if you're feeling that and you're in photo reading, uh, you're entitled to a conference with me. We developed that conference because we knew that there was a point in the process when almost everyone goes, I don't get it. It's not working. And yet it does work. So it's mostly just relax. You'll be okay when you, if you just take it that way. That would be my suggestion to that student is it'll be okay. Just give yourself a, a fighting chance here. Yeah. All right. And last question before we go to our sort of fun practice, subject specific practice is about how do I fight procrastination? Ooh, how do you fight procrastination? Man, that is a great question, isn't it? I'm procrastinating. Now, I think that it comes from a couple of things. One is how big is your why? That if I, I often use this example, if I had a ransom picture of your favorite pet, if I had a picture of Megan's dog Moose, and I said, if you ever want to see Moose again, you got to get this assignment done or, or you know, edit this book, it, it would get done. And it, because now we've changed the balance of risk and reward. So there's that some part of that. There's also a part of which I think people take on too much of the work. And they see the whole big picture instead of seeing it in smaller bite-sized pieces. So if you're procrastinating, I think the answer is you go to the, the course outline and you say, I just need to get this one assignment done, not all of the assignments, or I need to get this lesson, this assignment within this unit done. And, and that creates momentum for people. Do you see that where people just overlook, they, they look at it too big and then it just overwhelms them? Yeah, definitely. I've been talking with a lot of students about this on a really micro level within their essays. And I think it's really similar. So when you're staring at a blank screen, right? It feels so overwhelming of how am I possibly gonna get to the other side of this essay? And it's the same with your studies as a whole. When you're staring at this huge list of all of these assignments, it feels insurmountable. And so I don't definitely echo the what I talk with my students about a lot with the writing is how to break this down into really small. You do the next step, you do the next step. And it's the exact same thing with the course as a whole. And I, I know several of my students will laugh and know this, that I've told them this, but my daughter is a huge Frozen fan and there's a song in it that honest things about do the next right thing. And it really is that. It's you take the next step and then the next one, and you don't worry about even the step after this one. You just, you can't think about that yet. You just have to do the next right thing. And once you've done that, it's all good. I got endorsed by June. That's, that's the good endorsement. Yeah. Once you've done that one thing, then you will be better equipped to take the very next step, but you don't have the tools yet maybe to do the step three or four down the line, but that's okay. You just do the next one. If you've been on my call, I refer to this a lot of, we are not 
doing a sprint. We are training for a marathon. And if you're a runner or if you ever wanted to train for a marathon, you don't just go out and run 10 miles. You don't do that. Your body will fall apart. So we're, we're training for this marathon. We're like, Nia says, we're doing a step. And then a step leads to another step. And the next thing you know, you've ran a mile and then two miles. And what you were worried about, the subject, if you go step by step, when you get to that subject, it's not as scary as you thought it was. So don't, again, think too far ahead. Think of right now in this moment and just do bit by bit. And that creates, that leads to, oh, wow, I'm done. Yeah. And, and, and I can say from personal experience that I, I get into that overwhelm and June pulls me back off the ledge and says, just do the next step. Just do the next thing you have to do here and, and you're going to be okay. Listen to that wisdom. It's important, I think, to recognize that it's doable and manageable. And this procrastination right now is a very common piece when we see it. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. So we're ready to transition into our uh, like topic uh, discussion for today, which I'm excited because we get to do a little bit of MBE practice within the topic too. <laughs> yeah. So we started a series back before Christmas called the study questions that keep you awake. And we asked you to give us some of the things that kept you awake and specific questions. And I'm going to invite you to continue to send us those topics and to give us the things that you were concerned about. And uh, we got through some of them and got some great feedback, but I wanted to pick up a, another topic today. Somebody asked about double jeopardy and they wanted to know, what do we do with double jeopardy? How do I answer that kind of a question? And I thought it would be helpful to explain this both in terms of a mind map and in terms of doing a couple of questions. So. Let's just talk about double jeopardy generally. And we're going to put this into bar maps. So if you are a bar map student, you will be able to find this in your CRIM bar maps. But double jeopardy is one of those subjects in CRIM Pro that seems to cause people some problems. So how do you mind map a topic like this when it's a little more detailed? And the reason that I think it merits a bigger mind map is that it is a full section of our larger CRIM Pro topic area. It's a, a subheading. So we create this sub mind map. And we did this in MindMeister. And the way that I start with this uh, is that I begin with what I call the, the general principles. And I highlight the first general principle of uh, double jeopardy, which is the rule itself, which is that no person subject for the same offense to be put twice in jeopardy of life or limb. That's your constitutional protection. And it's applicable to the states through the 14th Amendment. So that's the basic rule. And I like to highlight that and just show it a little bit differently here. Then I have some general principles when I'm not going to go through all the details here for you today, but I want to just give you an overview. If I'm thinking about double jeopardy in the larger context, I know that we're what we're really talking about is being tried twice for the same offense. And if there's one criminal transaction, it's all merged together into one offense. So I know that we have to have one offense that you're being tried for. I also know from the outline that a continuing criminal conduct, if there's activity that continues over time, that's also considered one offense. So that's not double jeopardy. It just all comes together. What if there's one criminal transaction and it has different offenses? In that situation, each action against a separate victim is a separate offense and you could be tried separately and that doesn't violate double jeopardy. What about lesser included offenses? In that situation, uh, they're deemed to be the same offense if it's lesser included. So there's no double jeopardy problem there. It's all put together in one offense. Now, the next thing that I want to do is I want to look at exceptions because exceptions are testable on the MBE. And I've identified four exceptions here. The first having to do with if the elements that constitute that second double jeopardy offense haven't occurred when you're being tried on the lesser offense, then you could be tried later for the second offense and it's not double jeopardy. So that's one exception. Or if the defendant moves that the lesser and greater offenses be tried separately, if that motion is successful, you don't have double jeopardy protection there either. What about if there's a guilty plea to the lesser included offense 
and the greater offense remains pending, uh, then that is what's called an implied acquittal. And in that situation, uh, the jury uh, is charged to consider both the greater and a lesser included offense. That doesn't violate double jeopardy. And then the last of the exceptions is that the same action could be prosecuted in two different jurisdictions, state A and state B. All right, those are our exceptions. Then in the mind map, we're talking about when a defendant is actually placed in jeopardy, and we've got some information there. And then we've got some information about when a retrial is possible over here, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. And then we've got a little bit of information about collateral estoppel and what makes that different from double jeopardy. And then what happens if the prosecution decides to appeal? Is that double jeopardy? And then finally, is there double jeopardy with respect to sentencing? So my point is that I've set up this mind map. Now, how long did it take to create it? About 15 minutes, that's all. It's not terribly uh, time consuming, but again, we've provided it for you. But if you were doing your own in MindMeister, we just went from the outline and we made it up. I just would love to point out that how you have just a little thing about collateral estoppel there on the side. Yeah. Um, that is a great use of mind maps in general to yeah. connect a concept, in this case in crim law, to collateral estoppel, which is a civ pro concept, but they're really can get the people can get confused about them, or there certainly are some, there's some relationship there. And I think it's so helpful to use mind maps for that type of information where there's no right or wrong, whatever in your own mind is connected, or you feel like you get things a little twisted in your head and you're not really sure the mind map is a great way to mark out the relationship and figure out for yourself how to think about those two concepts. Yeah, and I, what I just did, you can copy the link and drop it into your uh, civil procedure uh, mind map so that you've got that linkage there. So lots of different ways to do that. So you take your mind map and you look at it and the student said, I'm still not sure how to handle uh, these kinds of problems. I want to now take what we've learned and put it in the context of a question. You ready, Megan? Yeah. Okay. So here's a question that has to do with double jeopardy. And I'm going to read it in case you're just listening. Four hours into a defendant's assault trial, the lawyers gathered in the judge's chambers to discuss an evidentiary issue. While there, the judge received a phone call from his wife telling him that her mother had suddenly died. Without asking the lawyers what they wanted to do, the judge brought the lawyers back into the courtroom, declared a mistrial, excused the jury, and rushed home to his wife. A new jury was impaneled the next day before a second judge. The defendant has objected to the second trial on double jeopardy grounds. Would the second trial violate the prohibition against double jeopardy? Okay, now, remember, we've just looked at the rules here. And as you think about that, before we get to the answer explanations, Megan, does it make sense? We've done the mind map, and now we've got this, this problem. What are we going to do with it? Is it double jeopardy? And how do people feel about it, right? Exactly. So just like we were practicing before, the winter break period, uh, we were practicing this concept of using that intuition of first figuring out in your mind, what am I expecting? Do I expect what's the outcome that I'm looking for? So here it's a very basic, do I think that this is a double jeopardy problem or not? And we're being asked if the second trial violates the double jeopardy prohibition. Let's see what the answer choices tell us. The answer choice A says no, because the first judge acted in good faith in declaring a mistrial. Okay. Second choice says no, because the first trial didn't produce a verdict. So you have to ask yourself, is the double jeopardy rule require a verdict or not? I think that's part of where they're going. So we have two no responses, and we're going to have two yes responses. Answer choice C says yes. The second trial violates double jeopardy because the second judge's evidentiary rulings might be inconsistent with those of the first judge. And finally, yes, the second trial violates double jeopardy because there was no manifest necessity for a mistrial. All right, so now we've got our answer choices, A, B, C, and D. Let's talk, Megan, you and I a little bit about these. As we're looking at these intuitively, what, what's your first reaction when you're looking at this from an intuitive standpoint? Certainly for me, I notice right away that they give me these two no's and these two yeses. And so that's where I want to take my initial intuition yeah. about what am I expecting this to be uh, a permissible or not? Yeah, yeah. And, and so we're asking ourselves, 
is this a double jeopardy problem? And so when I'm looking at it, I think that answer choice C doesn't make much sense to me. Evidentiary rulings isn't the point of double jeopardy, is it? And I think that when I look at answer choice A, good faith in declaring a mistrial, well, there's nothing that I remember about double jeopardy having to do with good faith. So it looks to me like I've got really an answer choice B or D. B says, no, there's no double jeopardy because the first trial did not produce a verdict. Okay, factually, that's correct. There wasn't a first trial. And D says there was no manifest necessity for a mistrial. All right, now, I want to go back. If you go down to this uh, lower left-hand corner where it says when a retrial is possible, we've got a, a section there that I have now marked in green. And it says, if a mistrial is declared because of the sickness of the judge or jurors, or because of a hung jury, the defendant may be retried. And that's not double jeopardy. So that's interesting, isn't it? Does that change any of our responses now to A, B, C, or D? So again, going back, with that piece of information now, does that change anybody's view of what the correct answer should be? All right, let's see what we got. Remember, we were asking if the second trial violates double jeopardy. Answer choice A is incorrect. <clears throat> the judge can't be declare a mistrial based on his mother-in-law's death. A good faith basis to declare a mistrial is not enough for double jeopardy to, to apply. So if you answered A, that was incorrect. What about B? Well, B is also incorrect. Double jeopardy attaches when a jury is selected and sworn, even if there is not a verdict. So that's part of the rule that you want to make sure you've got. Then we get actually our rule from the mind map. If there's a mistrial based on the sickness of the judge or jurors or a hung jury, the defendant may be retried. And the judge here declared a mistrial because his mother-in-law passed away. So B is not going to be the correct answer. So if you answered B, you would go back and look at the mind map again here. Answer C says it's incorrect because double jeopardy prevents the defendant from being tried twice for the same crime. We know that. And the jury had already been impaneled. So double jeopardy would prevent the matter from going forward a second time. So C is incorrect as an answer. And that leaves us with answer D. So answer D is actually correct because there was no need for a mistrial. So double jeopardy applies. And now, what do we do with that? I want to go back to the actual mind map and show you where I think things and how you would want to do this. All right. So when can you retry the defendant without violating double jeopardy? Here's our rule. And it seems to be that this is the rule that we really wanted to uh, focus on. And so for me, once I found that rule here, what I'm gonna do is go back and I'm going to highlight that in green because now I know that, that was actually uh, part of an answer explanation. So if a mistrial is declared because of a sickness of the judge or the jurors, then the defendant can be retried and you don't violate double jeopardy, but that's not what happened here. So it violates the rule. So. That's what you're looking for. So the idea is you take your mind map and you begin to revise it as you work through the problem. And when you find an answer explanation that's either in your mind map, you highlight that, or if it's not there, you would add it. Okay, all right. Let us know if there are other topics you want us to cover. I hope this is helpful. I know that we're going through it quickly, but really my goal is to help you understand how to use a mind map to answer these questions, start to think through them. So if you're struggling with a topic, whatever it is, mind mapping it actually lets you start to, to piece it or pull it apart and see it in its pieces and then the application. And really, it's a very simple process. Once you've created your mind map, just do a word search for the, the topic in the question books, and you'll find some questions on that topic, and it's easy to do them, and then pull them apart and, and figure out the process. Wonderful. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all for being with us. Hope everybody stays healthy and safe. We'll keep you updated on any changes in the bar exam world. Make sure you stay connected in our private community group for the latest information and news. So thanks, everybody. We'll see you again next Wednesday. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening and watching the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers at celebrationbarreview.com.